everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome along here today to the Adelaide Branch May Technical Lunch. Uh, while you're eating your lunch, I'll just get started with a few of the introductions uh, before we get into our talk today. Um, I'll start today by acknowledging that we're on the land of the Ghana people and the, the traditional custodians of the land, so pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We've got a great presentation today by James Marsh and from one of our local students, John Zobniak. But before those presentations, we'll just like to run through a few announcements. So as you're all used to hearing by now, um, we still need to stick to the COVID restrictions and we're doing that here today with a, a reduced capacity. We've got our, um, our sign-ins at the door, so please make sure you've put your, your phone number on the list for contact tracing. Now, I'd like to also acknowledge our wonderful branch sponsors, um, our two branch partners, uh, which are our major sponsors for the year. Firstly, Bureau Veritas, and thanks to BV and the folks from there that are, uh, are here today. And secondly, Oz Minerals, um, and welcome to the folks from Oz Minerals as well. Our, the, the sponsor of our technical lunch series, which is where we are today, is Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thank you very much to them. And our media partner is Heathgate Resources. So really it's thanks to all of those sponsors um, that we get to come along here today at a, at a subsidised rate for lunch and also um, to give back to some of the members through a loyalty scheme where... Uh, You've hopefully all got your uh, loyalty card stamped today on the way in and we uh, have the, the sixth one of these lunches for free. So just quickly talk about some upcoming uh, Oz IMM events. The June Tech Lunch, which is right here in, uh, in a month's time, it will be by Professor Nigel Cook from the University of Adelaide. Should be a really interesting talk uh, from him, talking about the research work that they have been doing there in the copper and uranium hub. That is on the 17th of June, as I said, right here. In July is a, a date to make sure you put in your calendar. Our annual dinner, again, right here in this room. Um, it's always a great night. Um, pleased to announce, if you, uh, if you haven't seen already, that our guest speaker for that night will be Associate Professor Alice Gorman from Flinders University. And if you don't know Alice, she's an internationally recognised leader in the field of space archaeology. Um, she often talks on uh, ABC Radio. They interview her with anything to do about space. So she's a great public speaker. Um, and, uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from her. We'll get the registration portals for both the June lunch and this July annual dinner up uh, really soon, and you'll see those in your inbox. And now a new one to announce, um, the August technical lunch here. Um, we'll be hosting the Metallurgical Society's Distinguished Lecture. Uh, Fran Burgess is a name that many in the metallurgical world would have heard of. She's got a 40-year-plus career in operations management, most recently being the um, general manager at Mount Isa Mines Zinc Concentrator. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that'll be here on the 19th of August. It will be an absolutely fantastic lecture and um, with much more wide-ranging appeal than, than just metallurgists as she talks about uh, her 40 years in operations management and what makes, that, uh, what makes a successful team. should be a really good one. Finally, just to quickly mention, the Uranium Conference is also coming up. It's uh, hosted by the Adelaide branch and some of our committee members helped to, to organise that conference um, that's held completely online over a couple of weeks in August. Um, so if you're interested in that space, really encourage you to, to uh, get along to that one as well. We're also holding a competition on that one for our local university students to attend for free. So uh, if you are in that boat, have a look on the, the uh, Facebook pages for some more info on how you can enter to get that free ticket. All right, I think it's time to draw the door prize while you continue eating your lunch. So, 
We'll get. If somebody has a pink ticket with B93 on it, we have a, a $50 door prize. Do we have? We have Scott. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll we'll arrange for a a $50 voucher that can be used at the Ozim online store. Well done. All right. Um, I will now pass over to um, Peter Rowley from the AIG. This event today we are holding jointly with the AIG. Um, we welcome some of their members along. So thank you very much for coming and I'll pass over to Peter. Welcome to the joint OSIMM AIG lunch uh, and uh, Nicole Peter Hill are here today from the AIG as well committee and uh, thank you and on behalf of the GSA Anna Petz is the normal representative uh, of the Ge Geological Society of Australia and unfortunately she sends her apologies today. All I'm going to do is introduce that the AIG does exist uh, in Adelaide. We meet regularly the first Thursday of every month uh, down at uh, the Ale House on uh, Pulteney Street, um, about six o'clock for free drinks and uh, followed by 6.30 with a, a, usually a technical talk uh, followed by more free drinks and free pizza. So, uh, and it's open to everybody. So you don't have to be a member. It's free whether you're a member or not. So we'd love to see you come along. It's a very casual, it's, it, we insist upon you speaking to each other uh, and uh, getting to know each other. We are well supported by sponsors and, and uh, so we also thank Bureau of Veritas uh, sponsoring our next event in a couple of weeks. We, um, I've probably said all that bit already. That's one of our younger folk. Uh, some of you may know him. He's an outstanding geoscientist by the name of Chris Anderson. He gave a, a talk recently on uh, 4 for 40. It was meant to be delivered at last year's uh, cricket uh, game here in, uh, at the Adelaide Oval. Uh, but it was with refer reference not just to the cricket score, but to his life's achievements, 40 posits over 40 years. And so he gave a kind of summary of those geophysical characteristics that they got wrong and those geophysical characteristics that, in fact, the drill hole happened to discover, uh, like uh, all bodies. So we have some great, uh, great times. Coming up in June, we have uh, Professor David Cohen and Dr Neil Rutherford uh, coming across from New South Wales to speak to us about uh, the magic of sampling some soil that's 100 metres above where the ore body should be and you can invent all sorts of data mining statistics and characteristics to tell you that you should have drilled there yesterday. So uh, free, it's free, you can come along, you can get free drinks and, uh, and a free great talk. Uh, we also, uh, the AIG in conjunction with the OSIMM, in conjunction with the Geoscience Australia and in conjunction with uh, the Exploration Geophysicists uh, branch here in Adelaide, uh, as volunteers organise the South Australian Exploration Mining Conference, SAMEC, otherwise known as. It's pretty well always on the last kind of Friday uh, of uh, November, uh, thereabouts. That's the date uh, this year coming up. It doesn't clash with the cricket this year. And um, uh, so we, they're invited speakers, they're not brokers, so you actually learn something about the real world. Uh, we have outstanding support from BHP, Osmin, Luca, the major companies, as well as active explorers in the state. So if you want to find out what's going on, turn up to the SAMEC conference and we'd love to see you there. Um, I think that's about all the slides I've got. That's the end slide. Um, so, uh, AIG, Australian Institute of Geoscientists, uh, we'd love to see you come along uh, to share, uh, to enjoy uh, some uh, great conversations, some great talks, and enjoy some great company. Thank you.
Right, thank you very much, Peter. All right, so our first speaker for today um, is John Zodniak. So for the past few years, the Adelaide branch has worked closely with the local uh, student recipient, recipients of the OzIMM's scholarships. They're the EEFs, the Education Endowment Fund, and our own joint scholarship with the Playford Trust. By providing guidance and mentors, plus the opportunity for those winners to network and to present a short talk at one of our local events. So today we have one of those short talks from John Zodniak, the first mechanical engineer to receive an EEF scholarship and the first in recent memory from UniSA. So prior to commencing his studies, John worked in medical device development in leading industry organisations in a variety of operational roles, including mechanical maintenance. An understanding of the importance of mining and the resources sector to the economy together with an appreciation of the career opportunities fueled his choice of tertiary studies. Um, he's an active believer in promoting the industry and his benefits, an active volunteer in the community, including the university where he plays an active role as a mentor, supporting commencing students' transition to university life. So I'd like to welcome John. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to present here today. My name is John Zobniak. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering student at the University of South Australia. My project name is Coil Tube Drilling for, mechanical exp for Mineral Exploration and I will focus on low torque drilling tools. My project is done in cooperation with MINEX CRC at the University of South Australia. Mineral exploration and the mining industry play a vital part in the Australian economy by providing employment, taxation revenue, and supporting other industries with capital expenditure valued at around $260 billion. This industry's success is measured by demand for its products and operational efficiency and productivity. One of the primary considerations in mining efficiency is the drilling equipment. The existing drill bits are susceptible to failure due to improper material composition, mechanical design, insufficient cooling, vibrations, and the bearing supporting the drill bit rollers. The project will focus, will consider the technolo technological challenges introduced by diverse rock and soil hardness. <coughs> so, this slide, uh, we see a different type of drill bits. The uh, advantages and disadvantages for different scenarios. So a little bit of uh, types of wear and drill bits. So drilling bit uh, wear and replacements are the most significant contributors to mineral exploration costs. As described in the images, current bit design cannot provide adequate cost-effective performance due to the constant impact of the bit with the hard rock and penetration through various soil types. That leads to increase, increased energy consumption, bearing failure, excessive fatigue, erosion, and abrasion. Wheel bits can be mainly classified as chemical, abrasive, adhesive, erosive, and fatigue. The bit cones body absorbs the deformations, stress, vibrations during drilling and has to resist the ambient conditions. During drilling, drill bit inserts have to endure the elevated hardness of rock, friction with the grounds, and resistance to fracture. Material selection for drilling is restricted to vibrations, temperature, design loads, considering resistance to fracture, erosion, and abrasion. Bit body usually wears faster than the inserts, which causes the detachment of inserts. One detachment of bottom increases the uh, forces of dynamic impact of the rest of, on the rest of the bottoms. Bit body wear usually attributed to misuse or manufacturing issue. Coil tubing drilling for mineral exploration requires tools that can drill in hard rock with low weight on the drill bit and limited torque provided by the downfall motor. Projects, uh, project aim and objectives. The broad aim is to provide an innovative design for a drill bit that is adequate for various rocks which conventional hydraulic percussive methods cannot fragment. The research project will comprise of a drill bit conceptual design that will be established on comprehensive literature review of existing bit designs offered for diverse substance hardness. 
distinguishing characteristics of present and novel bid designs identified in the literature. Designed to <coughs> increase the operational life for geobits for comparable functions, supported by failure analysis of components, focusing on increased durability. Stress analysis and the selection of material composition using health calculation and finite element analysis for the components and their interactions with different materials during drilling operations. And the last one, design of a novel coil tube drill bit for production and experimenting under real life conditions. The knowledge gap found in the industry is uh, the literature review provided the functional principles of different drill bits considering conceptual design materials and their bearings. By addressing those three topics in the new drill bit design, the operational cost can be reduced dramatically by extending the drill bit operational life and increasing drill drilling efficiency. The main gaps identified are for design out of the existing concept, the cone hybrid PDC drill bit provides promising results re <coughs> regarding reduced wear and high rate of penetration. However, this concept has been tested under one specific rock, ty rock type and unsuitable for drilling in relatively soft formations. Gap in materials found is a material where in drill bit is mainly attributed to misuse and manufacturing issues. However, material wear has not been studied to understand real-time damage occurrence and it's suggested to employ a feedback system. Lastly, the bearing gap found that bearings, bearings are highly susceptible to damage and there is no concrete concept that outweighs the others. There is no existing method to maintain proper lubrication within the bearing during drilling operations in elevated temperatures. The research aim is to create a detailed design of a new low torque drill bit to extend drill bit life in various drilling conditions by addressing the literature review gaps and increased, increasing the efficiency of, of the exploration, oper exploration operations. <clears throat> Methodology. The research will be initially based through literature review and existing design and materials compositions. The research process, process will include site visits at the MINAC CRC research lab and the actual drilling site at the later stage. Current drill bits will be investigated and the root cause analysis of their failure modes will be studied through different case studies in the literature. In the second half of the year, the conceptual designs will be proposed and by using design selection matrix, the unfeasible designs will be eliminated by the MINAX team. The remaining concepts will undergo design improvements and be validated with hand calculations and finite element analysis for possible failure modes. All required modification to the, to the mechanical design and material composition to be deployed to optimize the results. The latter stage will include detailed drawing for manufacturing. The selected conceptual design will, given, will be given to Minix for, for manufacturing testing in a designated lab to assess if the suitable design is achieved to prolong a bit service life for the required soil or the rock parameters. So the next step will be to submit an official research proposal. Uh, later, my plan is to start working on potential concepts. The concept will be presented to the client and the most appropriate will undergo initial finite element analysis for the feasibility studies. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thanks very much, John. Um, what we'll do is, uh, if you've got any questions for John, um, save them till the end, and we'll have a question time for both John and, and James at the at the end of today. So, on to our main presentation now by James Marsh. James is the Andromeda Managing Director and a qualified industrial chemist with over 30 years of industrial mineral experience. He's got wide range of kaolin experience in R&D, product development, operations and global marketing and sales roles. And he's very excited to be able to play a part in the commercialization of Andromeda's world-class alloy site, Kaolin Resource, as well as its new emerging clean tech applications. So please welcome James. Hello everyone, thanks for coming and listening to me. Um, it makes a nice change uh, to have a room that's actually not full of investors. 
um, although you might be by the time I finish. Um, but I get a chance to be a bit more technical this time. Um, I will uh, give this disclaimer. I'm not a geologist, um, but I do know enough to be dangerous. Um, but I have brought a chief geologist, Eric Whitaker, here to answer any tricky questions about that. And uh, he is now probably the world's leading expert in coding. There we are. <laughs> Put him on spot. <laughs> Hang on, press the wrong button. That's a good start. All right. So just a quick summary of what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, very short bit about the company. Then move on to the geology and resources. Uh, Kaelin, what it's used for. Holocyte, also what, it is, what it's used for. Um, the Great White Project, and then what's next for the company. So this is one slide about the, the company, just to give you an idea of uh, what Andromeda is about. Uh, Andromeda Metals, um, ASX listed company. It was previously known as Adelaide Resources, so some of you may know that company beforehand. Changed to uh, Andromeda about three years ago uh, when I joined the company. So we, our main project is our joint venture with Minotaur Exploration, uh, which is the Great White Kaelin project. Uh, and we also have Mount Hope in the same on the Air Peninsula, also Haloisite Kaelin. Uh, and our main focus is on that project at the moment. We've also got a 50-50 joint venture with uh, Minotaur, which is a natural nanotech, which is a company set up to capture any IP from the nanotechnology around Haloisite, which I'll tell you about. Uh, there are some other assets in the company, but those assets have um, either been joint ventured out or still looking for a home. A um, couple of gold projects, one in uh, Queensland, the one in South Australia, uh, and also a copper project. Uh, but say so we, don't, we don't do any work on those ourselves. We are fully focused on the Great White project at the moment. So quickly moving on to uh, on the mineral itself, um, Kaelinite. Now this is um, something that most geologists know is that white stuff that gets in the way when they're trying to find something interesting. Um, in our case, this is actually what we want to find. Uh, and for us, it may sound a bit sad, but for us it, it is actually interesting. And it's uh, aluminum silicate. Uh, there's a shape there that shows you what the shape of the cadmium particles like. It's a platy shaped material. Um, it, it's, so it's, it's very thin, but quite a wide surface. Aspect ratio can be quite large. It can vary from 8 to 1 to about 100 to 1. And uh, the average is about 20 to 1. Put that in perspective, talc is about 50 to 1. So it's uh, a little bit less platy than talc, so that makes it a little less talc texture feeling, but actually similar in some ways. And some people do get confused with talc. Um, it's, uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a soft mineral, um, only 2.5 on the Mohs hardness scale. So that makes it easier to handle into the process. Uh, it has minor impurities that we remove during refining, which are mica quartz and feldspar. Um, and you'll notice the surface chemistry, uh, it's not very reactive material, it's uh, inert to most things. But it has got, uh, first of all, it's got hydroxide groups on the surface. Those hydroxide groups can be used in reactions with um, specific chemicals, so you can, um, you can activate it um, to make it more interesting for sort of high-tech applications. It's also got charge structure, so that charge structure gives it certain characteristics when it's in slurry form. So the rheology can be quite complicated. Now, if we move on to the uh, industrial uses for kaolin, so this is something that um, you use every day um, in your life. You probably don't realize it quite often. Uh, for example, there's, uh, there's about two and a half to three kilos in every car. Uh, it's in the plastics, it's in the rubber, it's in the sealant, uh, it's in all sorts of areas of the car. Uh, the houses are full of it. You have it in your clothes, in your food, in your medicines. So it's used very, very widely, but it's one of those things that people just don't know much about. Uh, you see there that the market for, this is for highly refined version, is uh, it's probably getting close to about 30 million tonnes a year. Um, historically, the bulk of that has been in paper, and it still is the majority used in paper. Um, but that has been declining over recent years, and ceramics has been the one that's been growing. So ceramics uh, has grown up from about 20% now to 34%. Uh, then you see another whole uh, range of other applications there, and coatings is probably the next biggest one, um, which is quite important for us. So now as a company, we're targeting the ceramics market um, initially, and we're also targeting the high end of that. So that, that market for ceramics includes all sorts of things like sanitary ware, tiles, even fiberglass is in, classified in there. 
But the high end of that is porcelain end, which is what we're targeting, and the porcelain end is where the high value is for our type of mineral. So Haloisite, now what's Haloisite? So it's named Haloisite because it was a, a, a Belgian geologist called Haloi found it a long time ago, named it Haloisite. So this is um, essentially exactly the same mineral, but just rolled up, so in a rolled up form. So just a polymorph of kaolinite. Um, there are um, some known mechanisms for forming haloisite. The, the most commonly accepted mechanism is uh, it, it rolls up. So due to usually um, a very long time spent in very acid conditions, so we're talking about pH around about 2 possibly, as acid as that, it will, that will change the crystalline spacing of the plates and that will roll them up into a tube. And it also, does not, it also has another effect, so it doesn't just roll them into a tube, it, the acid will, will actually leach out impurities as well. So when you find haloisite kelin, it also means you've probably got a purer form of the mineral itself. Um, so this makes it very interesting, the shape makes it very interesting as you'll find out. Um, being a natural nanotube, a lot of people are spending a lot of money at the moment around the world trying to make nanotubes out of different materials. Well this stuff is actually occurs in that form in the ground, so that makes it very interesting uh, and much, potentially much higher value. Uh, and the fact it's high purity means also we can aim at the Kelly market where people want that high purity. And so at the Great White project itself, so the resource at Great White, uh, which is, is only one resource in the whole project area, this is actually a hybrid, so it's a mixture of the plates and the tube. So this is uh, quite common around the Air Peninsula. You tend to get a blend of the plates and tubes, so it's not um, one or the other. And so you see it on the top left there, that picture is um, typical Canaanite. That's about two microns across, part of the size. Um, and that will roll up. And the picture of the, uh, so the this one is the uh, hollow site here. It's actually, that's actually from Camel Lake in South Australia, which is on, in the Maralinga area. That's very high purity hollow site. And you see that the tubes are, are formed up in perfect little tubes. Very, very consistent. But the, the great white here is a, is a mixture. Um, and that naturally occurring mixture is very good for porcelain because uh, the porcelain people want that blend of the two particle shapes. They don't, they don't just want the site, they want the actual combination. And they, they, they quite often will buy the separate ingredients and blend them together. Um, or other companies around the world do make a synthetic blend which they sell. So the advantage we have is that we have that material in the ground as the blend uh, and it's very consistent and so it's a very large resource. So I mentioned nanotechnology before, now these, these nanotubes um, are finding their way into all sorts of new potential applications. It's, um, as far as clays go, it's the most researched clay in the world by exponential amount. There's thousands and thousands of papers, research papers around the world going on on the whole side of the month. Um, and the interesting point there is that there's actual no, at the moment, there's no existing general, genuine commercial supply of the right type of whole site from anywhere in the world and yet there's hundreds of patents that have been granted. So this gives us a chance to get into that market um, by being a holocyte supplier. So areas that are being looked at at the moment by us, so this is by the, uh, by the joint venture, we are looking at areas including hydrogen storage and transport, that's a pretty hot topic at the moment, um, batteries and supercapacitors, water purification, medical applications, um, carbon capture, agriculture, delivery of herbicides and, uh, and fertilizers, there's also some construction opportunities, um, some polymer coatings and remediation. So you see there's a lot of a very um, topical subjects there, a lot of very important applications going forward. We're having some, we're having some great results at the moment in the areas of carbon capture. Um, we're moving rapidly towards um, trying to commercialize that application. And I should say that these applications all revolve around the fact that you can use these haloisite tubes in their own right. They've got a very high surface area and they've got a very interesting structure. As a layered silicate with a complex charge structure, it means that they can be used and um, activated in all sorts of different ways to make them more valuable and more functional. And you can also use these tubes as a uh, sort of mold uh, to make carbon nanostructures from. So we're using the site as a mold. Um, and to give you an example of what we can do, if you, if you um, impregnate these tubes with the, the right carbon liquid and then you calcine on them and dissolve the tubes away, you can end up with a nanocarbon nano structure that's currently got a surface area of about 2,000 square meters per gram. 
And that's just virtue of the fact that you've got this uh, massive amount of, in, of microporosity inside those tubes and a very complicated layer structure. So when you get to a surface area of 2,000 square meters per gram, and then you functionalize that with something that interesting, then you can get some very interesting properties. And so in things like carbon capture, we're getting great results. Um, we're proving it can capture vast amounts of carbon dioxide. And it looks like it could probably meet Elon Musk's targets very comfortably for his competition. Um, in concrete, we've also got some very interesting results. The, the, the shape of the particles and the charge structure of the particles means that when you put them into a very high solid slurry, which concrete is, and you've got a very high ionic strength in there, then you get some interesting rheology. So we find that holocyte will give, it acts as a very strong rheology modifier in concrete. So we're now doing a lot more work in that area because we can get some commercial opportunity established there by adding a small amount of holocyte material into a concrete uh, and boosting the performance, then that's a whole new market that we've developed, which is a truly uh, international market, not just Australian. So we've got some great results there. It's, pretty, it's part of what you pass the concrete standards uh, for Australia for use. So we'll be driving that forward as well. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff there. This is the upside to our project. So the good thing for us is that we have the very mature established market, which is ceramics, where it's been used in ceramics for a thousand years. Um, and it will be continued to be used going forward. That has grown year on year, not by large, large amounts, but it just keeps growing and growing. The people love it and they want to use it in their ceramics. They can't actually source it from many other places in the world now. The main mines have shut down the world, so we have what is the biggest resource probably in the world of its type. Plus we also have this upside where we have these all new, new technologies coming through at a much higher value. So just to quickly summarize the project, here you see that uh, you see where it's positioned. It's uh, so it's down on the Air Peninsula, um, the nearest major place. Streaky Bay is not far from the Great White Project and uh, Seduna. Um, it's so we are, as I mentioned there, it's probably the world's biggest of its type. I've got to say probably because I get in trouble with those um, with the ASX, but it is, as far as I'm concerned, it's the biggest one I've seen, which is very important because people who, who uh, want to use this material, they want to have the same consistent material for very long periods, ten years plus. They don't want it changing. So that makes it, makes it very interesting. Uh, when you combine all the resources together, we have um, in excess of 100 million tonnes there, so um, plenty of mine life for whatever we do. There's already offtakes in place for uh, letters of intent for offtakes, so demand has been demonstrated. Um, it's close to some infrastructure that's required. Industrial minerals industry needs cheap logistics, so it doesn't work. Um, so 80% of the cost is actually transport, usually. So we've got three ports there nearby that um, can service the mine, which is good. Um, we've also got the, nat the natural nanotech opportunities coming through, uh, and we also are looking closely at getting involved in high purity alumina, which is a pretty hot topic on the ASX. It's, um, it's the ability to produce high purity alumina, which is 99.99% .99 alumina from Kaolin. Um, that's, a, that's a subject that's well known. It was invented in the Second World War um, when the Germans cut supplies off. It's something I've been involved with for 30 years in, as a young chemist. Uh, and it's something that's getting more and more interesting for us. That we, we know that we have, in our holocyte cane, such high purity, it's very close to the theoretical maximum for alumina content, that we can go to a, a very high standard of alumina um, very easily with sort of low operational costs. Uh, and that material is currently selling, top grade material is currently selling for about 50,000 US per tonne. And that's going into things like smartphone glass, um, lithium-ion batteries and LED lights. So, some interesting opportunities there. So, a little bit more about the geology. Um, so, you saw the outline of where we are and the, and the resource area. So, this is a bit more detail. So, you see the Great White um, is here in that little red area, but around it there's a whole lot of other very prospective areas. So, we've got Hammerhead. We've already got a resource there. So, the, the Great White deposit itself is 34 million tonnes, and so our pre-feasibility study was based on that. Next door we have a hammerhead which is already 51 and a half million tonnes uh, of the same material. We've also got the Manta, the Tiger and the Bronze Whaler. Um, so there's, in that whole area there, so there's well in excess of 100 million tonnes of this material, so that's why I said I'm, I'm confident in saying that there's a, it's the biggest resource of its type worldwide. And What's it look like? Well, a lot of you have probably seen this sort of cross-section before, so we've just got the, um, get the pointer out again. So we've got the, uh, here we've got the, the key for us is that this is the white stuff that people 
normally get annoyed with because it gets in the way, but this is what we're after. So what we have, what we have is um, the, off, the overburden at the top of the, of the deposit. We've got about 10 to 15 metres of overburden, um, which would need to be removed in a mining process. Then we get down some cowcrete there that um, we have to get rid of, but we plan to use that in our, our road design, developing our, our road improvements. Um, there is some silcrete quite often that, that uh, we might have to get through, so I'll have to sand some silcrete here. Uh, that can be quite thick in places, so we need to get through that. But once we're through that, then we have a very large thickness of very nice white canonized granite. And then below that, we get to the, uh, down to the uh, granite layer below. So the good thing is we're staying above the granite level, so we're actually in a sort of, we're not affecting the water table, so there's no complications there. Makes, it, uh, makes our mining approvals much easier. So that's how it fits in. Um, you see there the, uh, what we have here is uh, the resource is um, very long and consistent. So we're about two kilometers on this first mine design. But the layer of, um, of Kelin, the fluorocyte Kelin is uh, quite consistent and it goes a long way. And it means that we can mine this uh, in a very effective, easy manner. Mining is actually one of the cheapest part of the process. It's more like a quarrying operation than a mining operation. Just give you an idea of what uh, the numbers look like and what we uh, what we analyse when we when we're looking for holoisite cutting. So here you've got uh, the whole rock, and here we've got the minus 45 micron fraction. So this is the whole ore at the ground, um, and these are our resource numbers. What we tend to look at we look at the particle size distribution. So the percentage below 45 micron that that gives you an idea of the recovery of the mineral when we process it. Um, this is a kaolinite total, and of that we've got the haloisite subset in that. Um, if, you, if you take the minus, minus 45 micron fraction, so you just take the sand out, so basically you're taking the quartz out, then this is what changes. Uh, and, and what we're looking for here, not just the haloisite um, number, but we're looking for the alumina. This is very important because um, it's not just a high purity alumina manufacturing where you need that high number. Uh, for ceramics, they want that number as high as possible because that gives you a uh, measure of the firing performance when it's put in the kiln. That gives you the incre increased strength. So you get the strength from the alumina. The iron is very important, and it's not just the quantity of the iron; it's also the species of the iron that has a very, a very profound effect on the, uh, the firing performance. So you want that to be as low as possible, um, which will give you a very, very nice white um, fire properties. That's also important in things like polymer applications and paint applications, because the higher that is, the less stability it has long term. So in, in your paint, if that's too high in a paint application, for example, that's why your paint turns yellow, because the UV will get to the iron and that will de destabilize it. The TI2 is also very important. This is important because that, that, that uh, contributes to the opacity of the mineral and its um, ceramic use. So if you want a nice translucent porcelain, you don't want much titanium in there, because that will block out the translucency and, um, and devalue the product. So just to give you some pretty geological pictures. Um, this shows you the, uh, the resource area itself. So here we have the, uh, the, the Great White resource. Um, you'll note here that there's an area here that is very interesting because this is a, a non holocyte area. So I've talked a lot about the holocyte area for ceramics. Well, the non holocyte area um, normally wouldn't be much interest because that's a low value material. To give you an example, the um, holocyte came in, we're targeting a price of about 700 Australian dollars per tonne. That's very high for a kelling. Normal price of kelling, you'd be talking about two to three hundred dollars a tonne, for example, as a standard grade. Well, that can be an exception to that if it's very high, high purity. And this material here, we're finding here, is extremely high purity. Uh, it's, it's the highest purity kelling I've seen in over 30 years. Anywhere in the world, and I've worked in 50 countries, so I've seen quite a lot of this stuff around the world. But that makes it very interesting, because that makes it possibly an ideal product for coatings. Coatings people, they don't want haloisite because haloisite messes up the rheology, um, but they want super high purity kaolinite to give it super high stability. They want it nice and fine for mechanical um, performance, uh, and they want, want it to be able to dilute titania down in formulation. So if it's got those properties, you can dilute titania down or extend titania, and that makes it more valuable in those applications. So we've got an area there that um, is very interesting. And um, we call this the great, we call this the great white, and we call this the dorsal fin. And down here is a pectoral, pectoral fin where we've got some other interesting stuff that we haven't got to yet.
just a, a quick outline of the project scope so you get a feel for what we're talking about here project-wise. So we're looking at um, a phase one of um, mining about 250,000 tonnes a year of the ore, uh, which will give us about 115, 116,000 tonnes of um, final product. Um, and then two years later, we're looking at doubling that capacity to 500,000 tonnes of ore, um, which will give us about 230,000 tonnes of product. That'll give us a mine life of about 26 years or more. Uh, with the current numbers we're working on. And at the moment we're working very hard on scheduling that, so it's all been done through Mindshed SERPA, um, software, and that's all being integrated with our financial model. Um, the mine pit design is uh, it's been done in great detail to meet all new specifications. It's a nine stage design based over 26 years. And um, we're also working on a written report by a competent person, independent person to sign off the reserve for that. Uh, for the project. So we're being extremely thorough, we've got, we're doing our own designs with our own mine engineers and we've got um, consultants we're using on top of that um, to project design for the mine design and the plant design and then we've got independent technical consultants above that who are overseeing the whole thing right through from pit to, uh, to, the, to the actual customer to make sure it's all signed off to, to the most uh, accurate possible level. Won't spend too long on this because um, there's a lot of information up there, but this is just to demonstrate that this is the, the flow sheet for the plant that we're designing. Any uh, metallurgists here might be interested. Uh, <laughs> so I thought I'd include this one for you. Uh, it's, no, it's no rocket science processing Kaelin. It's, uh, it's all tried and tested technology that's been going on for uh, over 100 years, um, largely unchanged in a lot of ways. So the, the basic process is first of all you take out the core stuff using screens, or here we've got a, a sort of trommel type, trommel type um, front end takes out the raw core stuff, uh, once it's gone through the screening process and it goes through a series of cyclones, hydrocyclones, um, just to get down to the right part of the size you want. So we're actually planning having three, uh, three banks of cyclone, hydrocyclones with a scavenger set at the end. Then after that, you, um, you go through the, basically the watering stage and it ends up um, going through a press filter. There are other ways to dewater it, but that's a conventional way for cones and it works very well. Um, so you filter press and then we are planning on noodling the product for ceramics. So with, for ceramics they want they don't want the powder necessarily because when they take it into their um, ceramics factory it goes to a huge bore mill and it's ground down anyway. So they're happy to take it in a noodle form. So that, those noodles are much easier to, to deal with. They're dusty, less dusty and easier to handle, easier to package. So that's our plant design at the moment. Um, and so that what we're doing is we're we're designing it so that the, a lot of the components can be used in the ramp up stage to the, so when we double capacity so we don't have to change them. We've just got to add in a bit more, uh, probably a bit more harder side learning capacity and a bit more dewatering capacity uh, and then we'll have doubling capacity overall. Probably say, uh, it's probably good to mention that we are, we are planning to use a high intensity magnet in there as well. So high intensity magnets are commonly used in cutting um, processing because they are very effective at taking out iron um, and also taking out titania. So for the ceramics applications that's important. Um, it is a quite expensive component in the plant but it does make sure that we will have the best possible grade in the world. So we're, we're planning to produce the premium grade of this in the world. So to do that we need the best possible processing. So a magnet will be, will be included in this, um, in this flow sheet. And just give you an idea what, what it looks like. So the, we're being um, as careful as we can with the design to make it as compact as possible, also to make it um, as low impact on the uh, local environment as possible. So the quarrying, the actual mining is like a quarrying operation, it only goes down 30, 40 meters, mm -hmm. so it's not very deep at all. Um, and we'll be using progressive backfilling as we go, so we're going to keep the footprint very, very small. The plant itself, won't, it will be no, it's going to be no tailings, no tailings produced, no tailings down. So uh, no nasty chemicals, so it means that we just take sand out and then sand goes back in the hole and then we rehab as we go forward. So that means that the government is fully behind it, so you can see that this is a, a very low impact mining project, um, but it will create some serious employment and some serious money coming to the, uh, not just the state, but the whole region. So that, that's making your life a lot easier in the approval process. So just a picture of the proposed layout, I say it's a, a nine stage design, so we're planning on starting down this end and then working back. Uh, we're putting a, um, big landforms here just to, to block out the actual uh, mine and 
and buffer the sand. The plant will be in here, all the processing, uh, and then the, uh, the hall will go in this direction to the, to the highway. Uh, as I mentioned before, we progressive reinstatement of the overburden uh, and the wash sand, so we just, well, the plan is to have uh, a footprint area of about 400 square metres at any one time. So that's all we're mining, 400 square metres, and then we're progressive rehabbing behind that. That means that control of um, dust and noise and so on is, uh, becomes a lot easier. This is what it looks like. So, see, it's a very basic mining, and just moving forward one stage at a time and filling in behind ourselves. Um, so it's um, it's not exactly strip mining, but it's uh, similar, but just by using because the material is so easy to take out. Uh, and visually, once you start, once you open the ground up, you can visually you can see the changes. So once the operators are used to mining this stuff, then we'll be able to um, selectively choose the areas. If our geologists have got a slight mistake, not saying they will, <laughs> we'll be able to actually uh, manage that as we go forward in the process. So at the moment we're going through the uh, the approval process um, for the government. So probably a lot of you probably know about this, how many. Uh, how intensive it is, how long it takes. So it is, a, it is an intensive process, but we're working through that. We put our application in, um, so a mining lease application went in 25th of February, um, and we're expecting or hoping, so I shouldn't use hope, I get told off using that name by the chairman. We expect to get it back um, by about October, a mining approval, uh, and the pepper, then we'll finish the pepper off. Um, and then if it all goes to plan, we should be breaking ground in February next year. So just a, a brief mention here about the uh, landholders and local community. Uh, it's a very important aspect of what we're doing. Uh, mining has got a, a pretty bad name around the world, uh, probably undeservedly in some cases, but deservedly in other places. Um, so we're, we're doing everything we possibly can to keep the community on board. We've done a whole series of um, open days and we are so we are lucky that this mine that we want to build is, is tucked away so no one can see it. There's not even there's not a road anywhere you can see it from. So it's gonna be completely invisible to the general population. The traffic will be the only thing that you know, the trucks will be the only thing they will see. Um, it's in a pretty deprived area, farming area, so it's um, low yielding farming land. Uh, and we only only gonna take a very small amount of land to do this. So um, give you an idea of the amount we want, we need about six percent of the, the farmers' land that they own in that area. So 6% of their producing land for the mine. So it's actually quite a small amount. The community is, uh, is very positive about this, the local Streaky Bay community. There's not much there apart from tourism. Uh, and there's a surprisingly large amount of flying flat out miners actually who live in Streaky Bay around there um, who'd love to have a job near home. So, um, so everyone's behind us there. And the questions we get, we do get questions about the three, three areas that people worry about are water. Not surprisingly, people worry about the water is an issue in that in the area, so they're worried about that being reduced and made worse by the mining company taking all the water. So, you know, we've we've um, stated that we will actually improve the water supply by what we do. Um, dust is also a concern, and so we've got full dust mitigation plans, um, and also the traffic probably is another concern. So we've got we're making sure that we're addressing all those concerns as thoroughly as possible, and we're actually using 19 sets of consultants at the moment on these areas. So it's not a cheap process. So what's next? Um, so we, we finished our PFS a while ago and we, we, had, we came out with some very good numbers for our PFS. Um, and we had an, an NPV, for example, of over $700 million and an IIR of 175%. Well, that's pretty unheard of for a mining project anywhere in Australia. So those numbers actually got people's attention. And so how, how, can, how can the hell you get those numbers from selling white dirt? So. It's been a bit of an education process and um, we've moved along um, and since then we have changed the PFS model was based on doing a DSO model uh, overseas and processing overseas so it was low low capex um, quick startup um, but we were sacrificing a lot of the margin to um, the people overseas so since then we've we've revised that uh, and you've seen the new model we've gone to is going to be producing on-site um, to quarter million tons a year, wrapping up to half a million tons a year of feed. So we're working very hard on a definitive feasibility study now and a bankable feasibility study. So that's all in progress. We're working very hard on trying to get binding offtake agreements. We've got one with Japan. So the Japanese, we've got Japanese partners that we worked with for two years. They actually got very comfortable with the material. They, they made thousands of porcelain items with it. 
uh, and they were happy to sign an agreement up. We're now working on other bank, on other offtake agreements for to, to will help for our BFS. Uh, it's not an easy process though because these companies that um, will be using it, so our potential customers, um, they ask us straight away, so well when when are you going to be producing? And you say, well, 18 months time, and they say, well, come back when you're producing, and we'll talk to you. So we get that effect, we get that problem sometimes, um, and the reason is that they they have to spend a lot of money and time to approve this product, so they have to stop their process they're using, their production um, standard production. They have to incorporate our material, test it out, uh, then they have to send that product to their end customers and, and evaluate it. So the approval process is quite lengthy uh, and quite in expensive. So it means it's slow. It's a lot slower than people would like. Um, and a lot, lot slower than shareholders would like, but they actually think they do understand mostly why, why it takes that time, and COVID has actually caused a, a slowdown as well of that process. Normally I'd be out around the world um, getting these approvals over the line, but not being able to travel has caused uh, a, you know, a big slowdown in that process. So we, uh, we pushed through the mining approvals. We are also, we're also looking at the possibility of pure high purity alloy site, so I showed you the, uh, the the hybrid that we've got at White, Great White. Well, if we've got the pure material, so close to 100% alloy site, then you're talking about something there that's worth, goes from $700 a tonne up to $5,000 a tonne. Um, so as an industrial mineral, that is extremely valuable material. And so no one in the world can produce that right now um, of the right tubular shape. So we've got a chance to do that. So we're working on identifying resources of that. Uh, for example, we've had a hole um, I think our best hit was about 93% alloy site in one of the holes in our project area. In the Maralinga area at Camel Lake, um, there is 100% pure material there. We just don't know how much yet. We've been trying to get there for a long time, but it's Aboriginal freehold land, so um, it takes a long time to get there. Uh, and we're also working on purifying what we've got. Uh, we've got a, a very large centrifuge, um, which we are going to be installing in our pilot plant to try and get that purity up. If it gets if it close it gets close to 90 percent or more, then we've got something there that could be worth a lot more money. And then all the work we're doing in the, in the natural nanotech side with the um, nanotechnology, we're getting great results there at about 40 percent alloy site. If we can increase that to 80 percent or 90 percent, then that's only going to get better. So we're working pretty hard on that. The concrete application testing. So we're also pushing that forward with some potentially big concrete um, partners to try and find out if there's a commercial arrangement we can get into where they can use this material. We're talking about only using maybe one or two kilos of this alloy site kettling in one cube of concrete. So that's one kilo in about two or three tons. So you're talking about less than a thousand ppm, um, which shows you how effective it is. And yet by doing that, you can get all sorts of nice rheological benefits and even some strength gain as well. So we push that forward because that could be a low risk uh, market for us. It could be a domestic market in Australia. That means that reduces any sovereign risk. Um, but if it works in Australia, it'll work anywhere in the world because the Australian standards are extremely high for concrete and they're highly respected around the world. So we know if it works here and uh, companies start using it here, then we can spread out globally on that one. We're also working on additional resources. You saw the, the map that we've got a lot of stuff around us. We've done a lot of drilling. Um, in fact, we've done enough drilling to get some more resources, but we just haven't had time to model those yet. So those will be coming through. Uh, we're trying to push the nanotechnology commercialization through. Been working natural, natural nanotech's been working hard on a uh, carbon capture pilot plant, which is um, we're expecting that to be operational in three or four months. And that carbon capture plant will be able to capture about 1.4 tons of CO2 per ton of holocyte media, uh, but that will be continuous. So it can be used over and over again. So that's a very interesting development, and we'll be publicising that as soon as we can. Um, and then also high purity limit. I mentioned that before. We are. Uh, we're looking at a strategy there where we can find the right strategy. There are a number of companies in Australia chasing that at the moment, um, but I'm not convinced they've got the right strategy and uh, we're hoping we will get the right one. So we're working very hard towards that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're, we're aiming to break ground in February 2022. Um, that's all the twos, that's two, 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 that's the plan. And uh, it's supposed to be lucky. I don't know if sure it's lucky, but um, it's optimistic, um, but we're pushing hard to get there. And um, as far as I know, at this point in time, there's nothing there going to get, to get in the way. And that's it. Thank you.
Thanks very much, James. Um, so I think I've certainly found lots of interesting stuff in there, even for a metallurgist, and <laughs> lots of chemistry uh, applications too. So time for some questions, if anybody would like to put their hand up. Um, I'll invite James and John back up here to answer any questions. Please use the microphone. Um, Hello, Sharon Hartz. Um, James, I've got a question for you. Uh, you yep. mentioned that there were a lot of mine sites being closed around the world. I was just wondering why that was. Yeah, so um, I probably should have specified yeah, China is the main area where they've been closed. So the Chinese government, um, you know, in their wisdom, they're building hundreds of new coal-fired coal -fired power stations, but they decided to target the mining industry to, to clean their reputation up. So they just sort of, they choose areas um, and the government, these are government teams go around and they say, right, all the mines in the area are shutting down. And it might be a couple of coal mines there, but whatever's in there gets captured by that. So they're, they're shutting down mines sort of willy-nilly without any logic behind them because coal mines, you know, they, they actually don't contaminate the atmosphere like uh, much. And so uh, they're being closed down for that reason, but there's also a number of major ones there have closed down due to lack of resources. So the, the whole site Kelly uh, has been mined and used in China for uh, 30, 40 years and the biggest producer of that has recently run out of resources. So they, they've been trying, they actually signed an offtake with us to buy our ore to process but we don't think we want to do that. Um, but it, it means it's good for us so and I heard recently that the second biggest mine in China now for Kedin has also run out of material and shut down. So it means that for us our timing is great because um, we're coming into the market as there's a, a squeeze on the supply. And um, not just that, it's the Chinese actually, they do, it, despite all the problems going on, they do um, still view Australia as a, a supply of very consistent high quality minerals. And for them, they've been plagued for years by inconsistent minerals, by you know, domestic suppliers, I hope they say. They'll, they'll change material over from different pits and different mines without telling them, and they'll mix it together and they'll send it from the areas. So, They've had this problem for years and years. So they see us as our big resource and our nice consistent material and they can see we've got the, the, the uh, applications, uh, sort of the actual properties of the material we've got and we're going to be producing our top no, top grade. So that's helping us. So we've got, one hand we've got the market is going up still, on the other hand the supply is going down. So, and then hopefully we're coming in the middle. Yeah. Hi James, I've got yeah. another question for you. Um, you mentioned that there's one uh, very high quality component of your resource that you can sell for $7,000 a tonne, but you said that there was, there's, it's not produced anywhere else in the world and it's not, so how is there even a price? Yeah, so, that, that was, so pure loisite is about $5,000 a tonne, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, don't quote me on $7,000, I'll get in trouble with that. <laughs> so $5,000 $5, a tonne is uh, pure loisite. Now there's, there's been a couple of, there's been a couple of mines in, in America that have been able to produce small amounts of it and they've got the market going but then they've just uh, disappeared because they, one, I know the mines very well, I know the people involved, I know the geologists and the marketing people as well and they've been unable to supply it. They've got very small deposits, very thin veiny stuff, that's some, one of it's underground, it's hard to pull out, it's hard to purify. Um, so they've, they've got, so there's companies in America especially who have approved it and started using it and then they've just been burnt off because there's no supply. So there's companies out there waiting for it. These new applications, I think there's about 100 new patents um, approved for Holocite last year alone. All sorts of new applications. Um, and people, uh, I get contacted on a weekly basis around the world from people um, who actually want this material. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that if we, if we can produce a pure Holocite, then there'll be, it's a small market now, but it's only constrained by supply. Um, there's certainly a lot of opportunities there to, to grow it, not just in the areas we're working on, but the areas, so coatings, um, plastics and polymers, and polymers and coatings are where it's been approved so far, and that's where people want it right now. And some of that's for reinforcing, so high, te high temperature deformation performance, and also for um, fire retardancy. It works as an intumescent fire retardant material as well. There's not much it can't do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, you mentioned, stay there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned water from the farmer's perspective, but I'm interested yeah. from the uh, processing perspective. Presumably it has to be pretty clean and you might need a fair amount of it. So 
can you tell us about your water supply and keeping chemicals out of it? Yeah, certainly. So this was an area, when I first joined the company, I, I spent seven years before working uh, for an American canning company, and that was the world leader in dry processing of canning. So when I joined Andromeda, I thought, well, this is what we're going to have to do. We have to use the same technology. Uh, and we did. We, we did a lot of work. We got some um, nice material and got some binding offtakes for the dry process mineral. But the dry process mineral, um, it wasn't pure enough to get the top price. It was We're talking about $400 a tonne there. Um, as opposed to $700 a tonne. But we always assumed that water in our part of the world was a problem, so we assumed we wouldn't be able to get enough water. But then when we started digging deeper, we, we found um, a technology that could actually process it by using uh, low levels of water. So we've got a plant design now being built that has 90% of uh, recirculated water. So it's only 10% losses to the plant, which is very low. Um, but there was a complication there that the water is a bit salty. So, sorry, the, the material is salty, not the water. So this is mains water, but it's salty. So when you um, are recirculating it, you're accumulating salt. So we will be putting a, an RO plant in there. Just to, and then what we'll do is we, we've worked out that we can put the RO plant in, we can use fresh water, and that goes back in at the end of the process where it's washed in the filter press. Then we get the required uh, salinity in the, in the final product. Uh, we are quite lucky that we're targeting the porcelain market. Now, for porcelain, the salt level is not quite so critical because it goes to the porcelain body, um, which is then molded and fired. If it was going into um, sanctuary ware, for example, that's a casting process, and casting is quite sensitive to salt because they have to use deflocculant there, and that messes up the deflocculant. So we're, we're lucky that we can tolerate salt, but we are reducing it. Now, we, we, still have, we still have to work out how to get enough water to the plant, even because the, the farmers around there have got some serious problems with water. So we work quite closely with um, SA Water, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, I hope there's no one here from SA Water. <laughs> um, but we found out that we could, um, if we twin the, twin the main supply into the Pucha area, uh, so we put, a, at the moment it's a 200, 200 mil line, if we put a 250 mil line in, then we can actually increase the uh, water to, the, to that point by about 30% after we've used our water we need. So we're increasing the amount of water available to the locals by 30% whilst also using what we need. Um, by having this very um, well-designed plant, so even, even when we dry the product at the end, we capture the moisture from that and condense it, put it back in the process. And by doing that, we found that we can, well, we haven't run the plant yet, but we believe from what we've seen that we will run the plant and we will have no water issues. In the geological section, you showed you showed uh, a horizon of silcrete. My experiences with silcrete have been fairly salutary, and that might be the hardest slab that you're uh, you're mining. Uh, the, the mechanical qualities of the silcrete uh, something that uh, exercises your mind in planning for the uh, the stripping. Yeah, so we have in, so in our mining um, application, we we have included the ability to do some blasting. Um, which is, when you say blasting to, you know, to the community and people nearby, they get, all they see is, is these videos of huge benches being blown up and they think that. And we, so we have to then tell them, no, we're talking about, actually there's, there'd be small pops going off in the silkery if required. So um, to be honest, we don't, you know, the silkery looks like it's quite thick some places and not in other places. So we, until we knock the top off and look at it, we don't know for certain we believe we can probably um, use a dozer to just drag most of the way, but if we can't do that, then we have got the ability just to, say, pop a few bits and, and just cleave it so it can, and it can drag the way. But I don't know, Eric, what are you saying about that? Oh, yeah, so it's only um, two or three metres deep. There's no big diamond holes. So even parts that are scratching through there, it's really six metres thick. Yeah, it's quite hard. You don't have to build space. You can't really tell. Ripping it with the dozer. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> ah, 
thanks for the talk, James. Andrew Harris from BHP. I was just wondering, um, I guess you're targeting different um, proportions of Halosite potentially, but is there any other separation or upgrade that you've managed to do yet or is commercialised other than the centrifuging? Well, it's, um, it's a subject that you know, I, I started life working for a company called English China Clays back in Cornwall over 30 years ago, and um, uh, they were the world leader in Kenya and um, for, well, for over 100 years. So I, sort of put, I, I was brought up in the University of Kenya, as was known back in those days, about 300 people in the um, research department on Kenya, so it was pretty unusual. Uh, and back then there was a lot of work done on purification of halosite. Um, English China Clays got taken over by a French company, which then became Imaris, um, which now is still the biggest cannabis producer in the world. Um, and it's got a halosite mine in New Zealand. Um, but that halosite is interesting because it's, it's a halosite, it's pure halosite, it's got a lot of silica impurities, which make it, crystalline silica make it a little bit risky. Um, but it's the wrong shape of halosite for new applications. It's called a prismatic type of halosite, which has got the wrong shape and doesn't work in new, these new applications. But it's very high purity, um, so it's very low iron, very low titanium, so it works beautifully in ceramics. So companies around the world, especially in China, will buy that material at a very high price. So that material goes about 1,000 US to 1,500 US dollars per tonne, uh, and they'll buy that and use it as a sort of sweetener in the mix uh, with alongside a pure kaolin, non site type. Um, so back in those days, early days, Zimris did do a uh, ECC, which became memories, did a lot of purification studies and work trying to work out how to purify. Now, you, you can do it if you use some very intensive metallurgy. You, know, you can use um, centrifuging and uh, selective flotation methods, and you can get to a pure, quite high purity, but it's not commercial. So, what you really need to do is you need to find um, a halo site that you can purify by a relatively simple process. And we found with um, the interesting, we found with the, the great white deposit. Um, that doesn't respond very well to centrifuge. You can concentrate down to a, maybe a top two micron top size and you'll get maybe 40% halosite, which is what we've done there. And if you do the same with uh, the hammerhead nearby, you would have got up to about 80%. Uh, not exactly certain of why. I mean, something to do with the shape. It's not just shape of the tubes, it's the length of the tubes, it's the wall thickness, it's the charge of the, of the tubes. They in different states of dehydration. So there's some quite complicated factors in there. You know, it sounds like a simple mineral. It's, um, it doesn't behave in a simple way. Um, and the fact that it gives us um, unusual rheology, you know, it's a, it's a thick, thick citrope as well. So if, you, if your solids is too high, you can't do much with it anyway. So we, that's why we're taking two approaches. We're trying to find areas of pure oocyte, which makes life easy. And, and Campbell Lake, there's been samples there, and John Killing is here somewhere. Uh, where is John? Yeah, John, world famous site expert there. He's the last person who got the Camel Lake and, they, and he had to go by helicopter uh, under the radar <laughs> to get a sample out. And, and that, that was up to 99.6% in highest purity. So, and that, that had beautiful tubes. The tubes were uh, just all very consistent, very, very high surface area, which is a very important factor. Um, it does seem like, so it does seem like some of the tubes seem to grow rather than actually get rolled up. So there's also a different mechanism there that we're finding. And even in our resource, we find areas where uh, we've, we've seen the tubes haven't actually rolled up, they've grown, because you can see the sort of growth formation. Um, so we're still learning about it all the time. And so it's one of those minerals that um, people don't know a great deal about. But now these new applications are coming through. Um, now since we started um, talking about it, there's about another four or five companies found it recently. So they, they can't pronounce it yet, and they, can't, they don't know what to do with it, but they found it. <laughs> so they're just chasing, they're following us, but so it's becoming more of a hot topic now. Hey, thanks very much. I think it's probably uh, time to end the questions there and invite Peter Hill to come and give the vote of thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Peter Hill uh, from IRG. Um, yeah, look, uh, great to hear you talk, John. Um, uh, everyone in minerals and uh, exploration uh, knows the importance of drill bits, so <laughs> I think get lots of uh, thumbs up for that one. A number of thousands of dollars we've lost, like a, with a dud drill bit, having to trip out again, or um, some sort of drill bit that ships itself too early. Um, yeah, it's really important to get that right. Um, and, and James, like the industrial mineral stuff, is uh, just gets overshadowed by the minerals in South Australia, but um, you know, I, 
personally, I've, I've been watching it for a long time, and I know John's been a big sort of a, a champion for that too. So, like, you know, Clay's at Birdwood, Williston to Pally Gorskite, and I used to love that Pally Gorskite, Kitty Litter. Um, but yeah, so best of luck with the Hello site. Sounds like got great technical team with Eric and great commercial um, prospects for the whole new kind of growing economy. So, um, thanks, thanks for both, uh, thanks for those talks. I've got a bottle of Plonk for both of you from ARG. Um, but it's tucked away here, and if I go there right now, it's going to crash down on top, and it's going to be very embarrassing. But uh, thank you both for the wonderful talks. Thank you. So, yeah, that brings us to the end today. Thanks, Peter. Thanks to the, uh, the AIG and the GSA and the OzIMM um, for putting on today, and we hope to see you in a month's time. <laughs>